with every achievement I got, I, I felt empty. I didn't feel as though I deserved it. And I discredited it and discounted myself. That pattern repeated itself uh, for many years, for many years, for many years, for many years. If it got too bad out on the streets, then I would go into a detox and I would come off the drugs and everything was great, and then I'd go out and do the same thing over again, expecting different results. Hi, I'm Laverne Tripp and welcome to Born to be Free. You know, for years I thought drugs and alcohol was my problem. But it wasn't until I quit or started trying to quit that I found out what the real problem was and the problem was me. When I turned the magnifying glass around and looked at what the issues really were in my life, anger, fear, bitterness, resentment, jealousy, the list goes on. That's when I found out what the problem was. Today, you're going to find out what the problem is, and I believe in your life you're going to be able to identify it, and once it's identified, then life comes better than you've ever dreamed possible. So stay with us, because you were born to be free. In treatment, we had a big six-page inventory that you would look at in areas. Uh, what we fail to realize is that until we do that inventory, it is going to skew our looking at everything else. Well, I think that step is crucial and terrifying. That was the scary part for me. Uh, I, I think one of the first responses to sin on Adam's part showed itself in an unwillingness to see himself as he was. Hiding, making excuses, covering up, and God basically commanded him, come out into the light and we're going to deal with what you've done and with who you are. And, and for me, dealing both with what I had done and, and who I really was, was terrifying because I think addicts are very good at convincing themselves that they are something they are not. I thought I was a nice guy. And I was as long as nobody crossed me. And as long as things <laughs> went as, as I thought they should, I was an extremely genial guy. Mm -hmm. so, so to let God dismantle my image of myself, was terrifying because it meant finally saying something similar to what David said when he was confronted with his own sin. I am not the guy I thought I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, therapy helped with that. When I had repented of sexual sin, one of the first things my therapist told me was, you are going to find it hard to stay away from sexual sin. You are going to find it horrifying to look at what is behind that sin. And, and so for me, that was the real dark turn of recovery, was starting to realize that no, I'm not the nice guy I thought I was, that I have rage in me and I have the capacity to be monstrously selfish and that the decisions I made were not just decisions to gratify myself, they were decisions to gratify myself at other people's expense. So I haven't loved, I haven't cared about people, I haven't cared about anything but myself and I hadn't even done a very good job of that. And, and for me, this is a lifelong process now, mm -hmm. is, is a willingness to look at the inner conflict behind the outer behavior. That to me is recovery. We all had counselors while we were in the, in the program of Teen Challenge and mine was Jerome Coakley and he was a professional counselor. And uh, he said, why are you so angry? Why are you so angry? It's not because you did drugs or you got high or whatever. And I was using issues like blaming my mother because she was alcoholic or my father because he was alcoholic, but still it stemmed even further than that. Uh, I found out that I was abused mentally, physically, and sexually as a child. I knew all along, but I blocked it out. And it happened to me when I was four years old. And that was part of a, uh, a way, I think, that reason why I was so angry inside. And I was sharing with Brother Joe, we were talking, and uh, I found that a lot of young men are angry who've been through some of the similar things. Mm -hmm. They're angry, they're violent, they've been molested, they've been touched, they've been fondled, and sometimes they do those things to others, they be abusive, and uh, they abuse, abuse other people like 
uh, physically, maybe sexually or whatever, and they carry those hurts and angers inside, and they need to get delivered from them. And I found out that I needed to get delivered. I needed to get healed. I needed to get set free. And um, through carrying all that pain, my only way of proving that I was a real man was I was the first to fight. I was the first to throw a chair through a bar window, the first to curse someone out, the first to hide my true feelings. I had everybody thinking I was mean and angry, but really all along I was a big teddy bear. Really all along I just wanted to be loved, needed, and accepted. Really all along I just wanted to be kind. I wanted to be friendly, but I had to put on that lie. And so when you come to the Lord, he really deals with you where you're at. He lets you know. He exposed that. You're not like that. You're not like that. So take it off. You can't, you can't fool God. When I went into uh, Penile's treatment facility for a year, um, it was December 7th, and I didn't have my first meeting with my primary counselor for maybe one or two weeks. When I met with her, she said, is there anything that you want to address? And remember, I had a treatment plan. So I came in and I said, well, you know what? I have a problem with procrastination. And also, this other treatment program, they wanted me to do an autobiography, but I really don't want to do one. And she said, okay, I want you to do an autobiography, and I want the first part done in two weeks. <laughs> so that's, um, that's how that journey began. And, um, and it was hard to begin writing it, but once I, I began to write it, I started to see some things. Like, even in my mind, as I wrote it down, I saw truths there that, that hadn't connected in my mind. I had this preconceived idea um, of what role my family played in my addiction, um, why I was the way I was, what events, how they actually happened. And when I wrote them down, it forced me to really look at them. Whether I ever turned it in for anybody else to see, I had to be honest with myself for the first time in my life. It forced me to look at myself and to be honest with myself. It also forced me to look at my perception of God and who he was. And um, I had to admit some things, that I was angry with him, that he had never come to rescue me, that I felt that he should have came and that there were no requirements, requirements on my part. Mm -hmm. You know, since you're to God and, you know, and I was waiting for you all those years. And, and I had to admit that I had to cry out to him. I had to, to, to grieve. <laughs> I had to grieve the change that was going on in me. I, there were things that I had to give up. Um, but it drew me closer to him because he said, I knew that all along. Mm -hmm. I knew that about you. My story as far as uh, substance abuse uh, actually begins quite a while ago. And uh, as I've come to understand it now, uh, might start when I was a little child, actually. I was an only child and I had a rich uh, and rewarding uh, childhood. Uh, my parents were divorced, uh, and I think that uh, made for me to be uh, even more independent. And I grew up uh, becoming enamored with the notion that I was self-reliant. But I was pretty alone. And when I got to college, I discovered uh, the social life uh, and discovered uh, drinking. Uh, and it was a magical experience because uh, it meant for me not being alone, but being part of. Uh, in college, I joined a fraternity and uh, the camaraderie there, the revelry, uh, was, was something that was very seductive and fueled by first drinking uh, and then, uh, you know, my first experimenting with drugs. I, uh, I let go of many of my moral standards. I see myself today as someone who worshipped at an altar of achievement. Um, and that was an idol, uh, something that uh, I held very dear to me. And, and yet it was a hollow experience. With every achievement I got, I, I felt empty. I didn't feel as though I deserved it. And I discredited it and discounted myself. And uh, that pattern repeated itself uh, for many years uh, and led me down, uh, you know, despite the apparent outward successes that I was having. Um, and my behavior became more, more invested in myself, more uh, egocentric. 
or self-driven. Until towards the end, uh, I was difficult to live with. Uh, I was not capable of being a friend to my friends. Uh, I was not capable of being a husband or a father. After having gone through uh, drug rehab and detoxification, uh, a program uh, geared up for physicians, I found myself uh, uh, still possessing the obsession and the desire to use drugs. Um, And there was a time when I relapsed. Uh, I understand now that, you know, all I had done really was to learn some new behaviors, but became invested in that same old strategy of mine. I can do it. I can handle it. I can figure this out. Part of that journey, uh, having come to realization that I can't handle it, uh, and needing God's help, um, involved house cleaning, looking at myself and trying to figure out uh, who I really was. Having gone through that process of self-examination and admitting those things to myself and to God, I admitted them to another person. And I found in that moment um, a spiritual awakening, if you will, uh, an awakening to the, to the notion that I wasn't uh, all that bad. I wasn't all that good. And I wasn't all alone. Because that's taking me out of myself. It's taking me away from self-reliance. And it puts me into God-reliance. I, and for the moments that I'm reliant upon God, I have serenity. I have come to know what His peace is. And I don't need a drug or anything else to make me feel any better. Have you made a decision to live for God and to serve Him, and yet you continue to fail? Have you accepted Jesus as Lord of your life, but yet you continue to do things that you used to do that you know are unscriptural? How do you get victory over those things? Well, I know for me, I had to do a searching, fearless, moral inventory of my life. I knew God was okay. I knew He was all-powerful. I knew He loved me. I knew He gave His life for me. But I couldn't seem to overcome these things that were destructive in my life until... I found out what the problem was. I was plagued with fear. When I did a moral inventory, I realized I had fear. Now, it's hard to accept that when you know that the Bible says that God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. How do you deal with it when you look at yourself and you get honest with yourself about yourself and you realize it's there? What about unforgiveness? Many of us are plagued with unforgiveness. We've been hurt. We've been ripped off. Those things that we stuff in us and don't get them out and identify them and let God change it will drive us back to our addictive lifestyle. It'll cause us to drink. It'll cause us to overeat. It'll cause us to get high. It'll cause us to go gamble. It'll cause us to do whatever it is we're doing that's destructive. Those things are not the problem. They're the manifestation of the problem. And the Bible says unless we put an ax to the root of the problem, it's going to keep coming up and it eventually will get us. I know I found that personally in my life. But once I did the inventory, once I found out what the problem really was, the insecurity that I had, the fear that I had, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the anger, the pride, the selfishness, the self-seeking. You know, when you look at yourself, and most of us don't do that, we look at others. We know exactly what's wrong with sister so-and-so. We know exactly what's wrong with brother so-and-so. And we're always talking about what they want to do. And one reason we do that, as long as we're looking at them and pointing at them and condemning them, then that takes the focus off the real problem. The real problem is us. I have a friend here in Tennessee. He has a sticker on his mirror, and the sticker says, you're looking at the problem. So if we're not living an overcoming life, it's not God's fault. It's not the devil's fault. It's our fault. We are responsible. 
But if you will look at yourself and take a moral inventory of yourself and identify the problem, then you know what to do with it. And then the next episode, we'll tell you what to do with it. Turn it over to God and He'll take it from you. There's power in His name. Trust in the name of Jesus today and be real with yourself about yourself. John, this, this business of, of addiction is, we're the center of the universe. Yeah. It's a pathological planetary system. I lied. <laughs> I've been saving up for that, Chuck. But it's true, you know, it's like gambling, and I revolved around gambling, and my family revolved around me. Exactly. And so that, that's the thing. And, of course, it took, you know, it took me a long time to understand that, that I had the pogo syndrome. You know, we we have discovered the enemy, and it's us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a little bit different, than Reverend Tiny. I didn't get mad at God. I know God well enough to even get mad at Him. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I'm sure I tried to blame other people for my problems in life. Uh, but I am still finding out things that I did that my denial was so strong I had forgotten. Now, I was a guy that I can tell you back to the third grade, but not probably the first grade, everybody who has ever done anything wrong to me. <laughs> uh, but I had a hard time remembering all the bad things I had done to people. Yeah. I was like, Joe, I'm a nice guy, yeah. you know. And then I started looking, and I thought, no, ain't very nice. Yeah. You know, but, but, you know, and I think but it's important to remember that these ego defenses we have, Denial, rationalization, intellectualization. Basically, they serve a good function to keep us from going crazy. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us could stand ourselves at all if we saw how we really, really were. So we have to have some degree of uh, defense mechanism. I think another important aspect of the, the inventory, at least in my case, and again, I'm coming from a little bit of a different perspective in that my life on the outside was not falling apart. There were not maybe as, as many serious life-threatening situations that I was in. A, a large um, benefit of talking with a counselor and doing that inventory was discovering why I felt the need to get the approval of others and, um, and learning and accepting the fact that I felt ashamed. That was something I, I didn't think was true at all. Everybody would say, oh, shame and guilt is always associated with these types of things. And I never felt that way because I thought, well, no, I walk into a room and everybody pays attention. I don't feel ashamed at all. But the truth was I was very ashamed of who I was if I didn't have all the other things, you know, going on correctly. And so really important part of my personal inventory was discovering how ashamed I did feel and how rejected I did feel and how I had always craved a love that I had just never gotten, at least not in the way that I felt that I deserved to. And so that, I just want to add that to the side of um, taking responsibility for things. It's also good to learn what might have happened to you that you're responding to because then it helps, it makes it easier to grasp mm -hmm. um, how to kind of walk forward out of that. Sister Annie said something that really hit home with me just then. She said that she was angry with God. And I was angry with God just for even being born. Mm. It's like, God, why did you even let me be born? First of all, you let me be born to a, a drug addict. A, um, my uh, father left my mother. He used to beat the crap out of her. I said, why did you even let me be born to uh, a person like that? Then my mother was an alcoholic. Then all the trouble I got in. And, and, and I blamed God, too. And I, I said, man, I was holding bitterness toward God. When you said that, it, it was like a light went on. I was angry with God. Why you didn't rescue me from jail? Why you didn't rescue me from uh, the perversion, the, the lust, the, the molestation? Why you didn't rescue me from this stuff? And, and I was just angry inside. And I was angry at God. And it took me a long time to say that. God, I was angry with you. That, you know, I knew he was there. I heard about God. And I had these issues in my life. I needed to surrender to them. And, and I think the first thing for you to get help, what I was taught in Teen Challenge, is this. You got to realize that you have a problem, and you have to confess it. Mm -hmm. You have to confess, listen, I have a problem with lust. 
I have a problem with uh, drugs. I have a problem with anger. I have a problem with lying. And you have to first realize you have a problem with drugs and alcohol. If you don't ever own up to it, you won't get your healing or deliverance. Right. I started smoking weed, you know, about 11. And cigarettes, I started younger. My dad smoked. So I just would steal them from him. And he never really knew. When I turned 13, I told them that I smoked. And they kind of got angry. But the next couple of days, they bought me some cigarettes so it wasn't anything that I understood or cared and I didn't want to be a part of their lives I hated both of them. By the time I was 14 I was full-blown into drugs smoking pot every day drinking every day going to school high uh, failing out of classes um, you know swearing at my teachers getting kicked at, you know in school suspension out of school suspension by the time I was 15 I was I was kicked out of the public school put into an alternative program uh, where I met more kids like myself. I was the kind of person that um, drugs were no thing. I wasn't, I didn't ever say, oh, I'll never do this, I'll never do that. I wanted everything. I wanted every drug that I could find, and I wanted more of it than anybody could give me. I just, my whole life, I just wanted to, like, forget about it and get high and get messed up. And I did heroin for the first time when I was 14. I snorted a whole 20 bag myself, and that's a lot <laughs> to, like, start off with. Um, people usually just do, like, a little line, and they're fine. And I did the whole thing, and at the age of 15, I experimented with PCP, LSD, um, cocaine, crack cocaine, and eventually, um, by the time I was 16, I was using crack and heroin every day. Um, at this point, the addiction really took over my life. I became an animal, someone I said I would never be, you know, robbing, stealing, um, making up scams, going from door to door with a shirt and tie on, collecting money for the Heart Association. The second day I was on probation, I got arrested again for assault and battery with a deadly weapon. And, um, and that brought me back into the court system and they, um, they were kind of getting sick of me, you know. But it was so hopeless because all I saw was myself. And at 17 years old, I was put in a St. Joseph's Hospital and, and uh, all along, I kind of played this game where if it got too bad out on the streets, then I would go into a detox and I would come off the drugs. And uh, you know, I'd, I'd kick my feet up eat some Italian ice and watch TV and, and everything was great and then I'd go out and do the same thing over again expecting different results you know and that's what they they call insanity is doing the same thing over expecting different results I just I gave up you know I was just like I want it I want what he's talking about I want my life to be different I want you know joy what is that <laughs> you know I want some of it so I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and and like, it didn't happen like people say like, oh, everything was just different and burdens were lifted off. It wasn't like that for me. It was like really slow, hard process of growth and learning and just like giving up bits and pieces in my heart more and more. And uh, at that point, I was in a hospital with nowhere to go and no answers. And uh, that's when I got on my knees and cried out to God and just said, you know, God, if you can make anything out of this miserable mess, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. And, and I, I finally gave up my whole heart to Jesus Christ. And, and it was like, I didn't know what I was gonna do or where I was gonna go, but I knew that God had a plan for my life and that I didn't have to live this way anymore. And uh, from that point, uh, I never done drugs again. I know my heart's not the same as it was. I was bitter and cold and angry, and now I really love people and it's not like, you know, I could have gone up to somebody and been like, I love you before, and I can do that with no problem now. And um, I can cry now, like I could never cry. And I'm just completely different. I mean, I look different and I, sure, I certainly act different. And um, I know that's not me. And I know I'm incapable of making those changes myself. Well, together we have seen some people today that have shared from their hearts. They do that for a reason. They really care and they know that there is a solution to the problem once the problem is identified. I hope these past few moments have helped you as you've listened to other people to look at yourself. I know when I looked at myself, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. When I really saw that I was the problem. But once I admitted that I was the problem and I saw what the problems were, I'm glad there was a solution. There was someone I could come to that was all powerful, all loving, all forgiving. 
Let's go to that someone today. I need help today just like you do. We need help together. And I'll go with you. Let's ask him today to give us the strength and the power, first of all, to continue to be honest with ourselves about ourselves. And if we'll be honest with ourselves about ourselves, then the truth will come into agreement with us and we'll get the power that only God can give. As long as we're in denial and as long as we're lying about ourselves, to ourselves, about ourselves, then God can't help us. All He asks for is honesty. And when we get honest, God gets honest and He's powerful. Father, I pray in Jesus' name today that you'll help each one of us to be honest with ourselves about ourselves. Look at our problems, not other people's problems. Admit what they are and turn them over to you. Today we do that. Together we turn our will and our lives over to your care and ask you to help us to be honest with ourselves about ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. You know what? We were born to be free. Have you been inspired to start your journey to recovery? Please call our toll-free number, 888-665-4483, and our prayer partners can help you find a group in your area. Or you can visit our website at www.ctvn.org and click on the Born to be Free link. There you can search our online database of recovery groups near you. When you call or visit our website, request your free copy of the self-help booklet, Your Dynamic Journey to Freedom. In it, you'll find an outline of the recovery process featured in this series. So take that first step on your journey to freedom by contacting us, finding a local recovery group, and getting your free copy of this inspiring booklet. Call now, because you were born to be free. When I was coming to church, I did feel guilty because I thought I was the only smoker in the crowd. Nobody would discuss it. I found out that there were many smokers and they felt the same way too. At some point, every prodigal has to realize that life was better in his father's house. I want to come back. If you'll have me, which I know you will, I have been wrong, and I'm finally willing to admit it. by the end lost touch with who I really was, if I ever knew at all. And the process that I went through uh, to, to do a, an inventory of myself, uh, to look at uh, you know, who I was, what was difficult, it was painful. And I know that I could not have done it without God's help.